wasn't at Saul's side until, he wasn't told that until he defeated Goliath. So that's, that was, should have been, it was recorded twice. And in that being, in this time being of this, this was about two years before the battle in Elah. Two years. Someone asked, well, why would Saul repeat his words? Shouldn't he have remembered David? No, this man was a busy man. He was a king. Just like I remember the first time I, I, I met, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Gabriel Swagger. You know, I thought he would remember me. And the second time I met him, he didn't remember me. Amen. So uh, busyness causes you to be blank sometimes. Amen. And it makes you forget. And just like me, I'm bad with names. So I guarantee you Saul was bad with names too. Amen. As we all are. So this would be the first time, the first account that David would be recorded right after his anointing. But I forgot to mention that Samuel would not be mentioned ever again in his next in these next passages. Throughout the life of David, Samuel would no longer be mentioned. And I believe because Samuel was no longer needed anymore. Amen. Samuel would be a prophet and he would represent the old way, the old life, which was the law. And when David was anointed, hallelujah, David put an end to the law. Amen. And amen. So let's begin to read out of verses 16, chapter 16, verse 14. It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. We're going to be reading him a while, so try to bear with me. It says, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Notice how it says, from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, behold, now an evil spirit from God troubles you. Let our Lord now command your servants, which are before you, to seek out a man who is a cunning player of an heart. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon you, that he shall play with his hand, and you shall be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well, and bring him to me. And then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is cunning, skillful, and plain, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a calmly person, and the Lord is with him. Notice how that verse 13 said, the Lord was with David for the rest of his days. That's, that blesses me. Wherefore Saul sent his messengers, verse 19, unto Jesse and said, send me David your son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey and laid him with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son and, and, and unto Saul, excuse me, and David came unto Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and his armor barrier. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray, this is a chronology that should have been placed in chapter 17. It says, And let David, I pray, stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And it came to pass. When the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Amen and amen. You know, this is probably the most great word that is ever known to the Bible. Why? Because in this verse, these verses, excuse me, are the foregoing of the anointing. Of worship and music you know music before this time was only sung in few occasions are you guys hearing me only few occasions music would be played say just as with the uh, uh, Moses when uh, they returned out of Egypt and they were, they were on the other side of the Red Sea what happened it said that little girls begin to play their tambourines hallelujah and I want to tell you this, music is always played when there is victory. Amen. Amen? I don't know if you guys know that old prophet story where it says that 
when the children of Israel were faced with enemies, and God told the men of war not to fight, but to put the worshipers first. Hallelujah. And out of that became their victory. And I believe it is the same way. You know, worship is the single most important thing in our walk. And it may not be necessarily with an instrument. For Paul said, we are instruments now. Amen. This is what a lot of people don't realize. They don't realize that their prayer life has to do with worship unto God. They don't understand that reading your Bible or, or meditating on the Word of God is you playing the instrument for the Lord Jesus Christ. Is allowing the presence of God to manifest within your life. Now a lot of people, they think that music necessarily comes from a piano, guitar, Indeed, in which it does. But the anointing, the anointing of music comes from the Word of Almighty God. Amen. 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 Somebody praise Him. And I want to say this. Music was gone for so long. It was perverted and corrupt right after, the, right after Christ. Even before that. And it was not really brought about after the Reformation. When the Reformation came, that's when the Lord began to move. And, oh, that's where you get the great hymns of the church. That's where you get John Newton. That's where you get all these, all these great hymnists. Because what they had a Reformation of God's Word. And let me tell you, my friend, the Reformation of God's Word is the message of the cross. The message of Christ and Him crucified on how to live for God. And we're going to be talking a little bit about living for God today because it has to do with music. And someone will ask, well, how is that possible? You're going to find out tonight. Let's pray. And I want to use for a title, The Sweet Singer of Israel. The sweet singer of Israel. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we come before you, O God, and we're so thankful, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would be upon me, O God, as it was last week, O God. We pray, Lord, that you would anoint me to preach and bring forth your word, Lord Jesus. But do a new thing in us this night, O God. Do a new thing in us, O God. Renew our minds, renew our spirit by the ministry of the preaching of the word of God. And Lord, I would not only ask for you to anoint me, but anoint every single person in this place. Anoint those that will be watching my internet, O oh God, that they may hear the word of God, that they may understand it, that they may comprehend it, that it may be rooted and grounded in their heart, O oh God. For you said, O oh Lord, that is not by might nor by power, but of the Spirit. And Lord, we're asking for the Spirit to come, O oh God. We're asking, Lord, for your strength to fill this temple. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen. You know, in the beginning of this, it would solemnly talk, get right into the Lord departing from Saul. And we have this question, and I know most of you guys know who Saul is. I'm aware of that. But for the fact of the ones who don't, Saul was the king of Israel. Matter of fact, he was the first king of Judah and the first king of Israel. Saul would reign about 38 years over Israel. 38 years. And that's a close number to the fact that the children of Israel were lost in the wilderness for about 38 years. 38 to 40 years. That should tell us something, my friend. Saul would be a great king. A lot of people try to uh, degrade Saul for his failures, but... I believe there is really no difference between Saul and David. If you were to compare the two, David would have more failures. But the only difference was the fact that David was a man after God's own heart. And in order to be a man after God's own heart, you have to not quit. It's not by you having any power or any power that resides in you, but it's the fact that if you don't quit, God won't quit. And the only thing that separated David from Saul was the fact that he did not give up on God. Hallelujah. I want to say it again. Yes, David knew his heart was exceedingly wicked. Yes, he knew that he was wretched just like Saul knew he was wretched. But David said, I know that my Savior lives. I know that God can give me the victory over sin. He said, create in me a new heart. Imagine if that was in Saul. I guarantee you.
see you, the Lord would have expanded his kingdomship. But Saul had a problem, as most of us do. He relied on the flesh. He relied on finding fights of his own mind. Now Saul was from a, a place just right outside of Jerusalem. He was from, let me go to my notes if I can, he was from, he was from Judah, of course, that was his tribe. But Saul was from a little, it was in the word of, of it's called Gilboa, I'm doing my best. And that means from a holy hill. You know, I believe that it was allowed by God. It was God's plan for Saul to be part and reign as king. And to be a part of the Lord's will in David's life and in Israel's life. I believe that he should have never been king. But I do believe that God showed grace and mercy upon Saul as he does with all of us. It wasn't really Saul's fault that he had the problems that he did. Well, why would you say that? Because he was a man of unspirituality. He did not grow up as Samuel the prophet was in the house of the Lord, in the ways of the Lord. But along his way, he was looking for a little lost sheep with his friend. And they came to a little city outside of Jerusalem called Ramah where Samuel dwelt. And the children of Israel had been bugging Samuel. They were, they were telling him, why does everyone else have a king except Israel? We need a king. And let me tell you, my friend, you and I need a king. But it's not the king as I ministered not too long ago of our own choosing. It's not a king of our own liking. And the Lord will always have us to seek His face when it comes to things of God and the providence of Almighty God. And Samuel saw this man, this man Saul, and Saul was of a good countenance, much like David. He was strong, tall, a very, a very statured man. Young, mighty. And Samuel saw that. But he didn't see his heart. But that doesn't mean that Saul didn't love God. He did. In that case, if we were to look Saul in the cardinal way, we would think that he didn't love God. But he had a love for people. He was a shepherd. Just like David. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that Saul was very much like that. As a matter of fact, that's why David loved him the way he did. That's why he was counseled by him. Notice this, he wasn't counseled by Samuel the prophet. The last time we read of Samuel is found in verse 13. We don't read of Samuel after that 16th chapter. Someone would ask, well, where was Samuel this whole time? Of the Lord departing from Saul. And Samuel was just like the church. They don't know what to do when the powers of darkness hit and attack. A lot of Christians don't know what to do when, when they're struggling with sin. When they're struggling with the flesh, the world, and the devil. They don't know what to do. They've been operating under 38 years of Saul. And the hindrance of Samuel. And Samuel was a man who sought God, but he too relied on his own doings. And I want to talk a little bit about that tonight, if I can, later on. Hopefully I can get into the power of worship. But I want to talk a little bit about relying on the flesh. You know, and I was thinking, I didn't really think much of Saul being possessed by a devil. But until I really started looking through this passage numerous times, I, I couldn't understand why that the Spirit of God left him. But the reason why is because Saul had been conflicting with the prophet Samuel. And it was around the time where he was fighting the Philistines. Samuel told Saul that you will defeat the Philistines on the seventh day, the number of completion. But instead, Saul went and attacked. Now, this was the first account of, of Saul 
Moses to win the victory. It was good that he wanted the victory for Israel. Like I said, he loved Israel. But he relied upon himself. As Paul did, he said, when I, I wanted to serve the law, I wanted to do that which is good, but when the law came, when the commandment came, sin died and I revived. Excuse me, I died and sin revived. When the commandment came, what did Paul mean by that? He was simply stating that when I try to do it, I'm trying to live for God. I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing the best I can. But the moment that I try to do it, all of a sudden, the very powers of darkness hit me like never before. And I, that which I do not, that I hate, that, that I'm trying to do, I find myself doing the opposite. Paul said, I hate that which I do. I hate the fact that I'm struggling against sin. I don't want to do it, but somehow I keep on falling into the same routine. Come on, somebody. Have you ever been there? And this is the same thing that was happening with Saul. Saul, the very name in the Hebrew means to be asked for. He was asked for by the children of Israel. Samuel's name in the Hebrew means that the Lord has given what I asked for. Notice there's a difference. Notice there's a difference. Hannah was longing for a child. She sought God on having a child, but she was barren. But she said, Lord, I will wait. I will anticipate. Lord, I will seek you until that promise comes. But we find with Saul the very opposite. Like I said, his intentions may have been good. His, his will may have intended for it to be well. But when you rely on the flesh, when you leave God out of the picture, out of his will, the devil will come in like a flood. And I love what a preacher once stated. He said, besides having faith in God, obedience is the number one thing that moves God's heart. Mm -hmm. Obedience. You know, a lot of people, a lot of cross people, as such as you and I, they have a hard time understanding that. A matter of fact, I can use for my own self as a testimony on being obedient. And a lot of people think that it's being obedient to God's word by living a correct life. But you got to understand this. In order to live a correct life, you must be obedient to his will first. Out of being obedient to his will comes the obedience of living for God. And I have to say this. The will of God is the single most important thing in every single one of our lives. It's the single most important thing besides having faith in God and His provision and what He provided for us at the cross. Someone can say, well, how is that possible? Because Christ made it His number one rule that He shall not go out of the Father's will. And just simply look at Saul's life. The anguish that he suffered, the trials and tribulations that he suffered was because of the fact that he went out of God's will. Three of his sons would die because of him going out of the will of God. Think about that for a moment. It allows the enemy to come in when we disobey God's will. Well, someone would ask, well, what is God's will? I would answer that with a simple question, the cross of Christ. It is God's will for every single one of us to be crucified. It is God's will, secondly, for every single one of us to rise in the resurrection power that Christ was risen in. He said, so as Christ was risen by the glory of the Father, so shall we. Romans 6. Thirdly, it's God's will for us to produce that which is of His will. It's not later 
It's not now, but it's in His timing. You know how many Christians are hindered by here and now? They want it here, they want it now. And it's a good thing. But, in order for God to move upon our behalf, it has to be His timing. You know, that's the struggle. That's the struggle that's been along with men all along. Was God's will. Do you know that? You know, men, the reason why men fell was because they went outside of God's will. He said, do not eat of the tree of good and evil. And what did they do? They disobeyed Him. They rebelled against God. Same thing with Satan. He rebelled outside of eternity. Hallelujah. Second thing, or third thing I want to get out in the Lord departing from Saul. I'm going to get out three things, four things if I can tonight. I want to get out the Lord departing from Saul, the sweet singer of Israel, the power of music, and the power of darkness. But in the Lord departing from Saul, someone would ask, well, why the Lord would depart from a believer? Someone who, even as Saul was, he was a king. You would think that it would be such a terrifying thing for God to leave someone in such a high position. It said the Lord departed from Saul. But I want to state this. Saul departed from the Lord. For the Lord departed from Saul. Come on, somebody. When we go outside of the will of God, it's not because He allows us to, but it's simply because we dethrone His position in our life. Kenneth West said that the reason why the sin nature would arise in someone's life is because. They disown the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. They disdain him from him being a king and reigning over your heart. I love what the poet said. He said, Lord, make my heart your holy kingdom, that I may crown you Lord of all. Hallelujah. And when we put ourselves in a position, just like Paul said, he said, when the commandment came, I died. When we rely on the flesh and we try to do it ourselves, we try to uh, say, Lord, have, have it be this way, and then, Lord, bless it. Or, Lord, I'm going to go fight the giant, but I'm going to wear Saul's armor. Bless it. And I pray that it be your will. No, we got to solemnly pray in our prayer life that, Lord, I don't want nothing to do with it. I don't care when it comes. I don't care how it comes. All I'm believing for is that it's coming. You know, a lot of people, they try to 
outsmart the devil. They try to say with a fast amount of days that we can overcome the devil. <laughs> they try to say if we come up with a, 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 a diagram or a, a pyramid, that somehow we can, we can outsmart the devil. Oh, they say that if we, if we have a grace revolution and we find out that the devil can make us sin, but that doesn't mean sin has a power over us because we're allowed to sin because of God's grace. They think they outsmart the devil. You guys get what I'm saying? Hallelujah. But we can't. The only thing that can defeat the devil and the powers of darkness is the anointed one, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We can't do it. I love to say that I'm here because today, I'm here today because of the fact that I'm of my own power and my own might, that I was strong in the faith and that I held on, that there were never days where I was low, there was never days that I didn't have that work bleak, there weren't days that I didn't feel degraded, there weren't days that I never felt condemned in my sin, that there weren't days that I never had to fight a lion or hear the roar of a bear, no, there was those days. There were those days where I thought that I was no longer going to make it. There were those days where I was like so that I felt like the Lord departed from me. There was like days where I felt like I was wrestling the powers of darkness. And my friend, we are. We're in a fight. I want to encourage that upon your heart. You and I are in a fight. And guess what? And I was thinking about it this week when I was getting my message ready. It's kind of like the job I'm doing. I'm being trained on the job. I don't know how to paint. I don't know how to mask. But my dad said, you're going to learn on the job. You don't have to go to a trade school. For you got me. You got your papa who's been doing it for years. And that's the same thing with you and I. You got your papa right up there in heaven. You don't need to go to a trade school. You don't need to go to a Bible college. You got single day in your life. And I thought that. I told my dad, I don't know how to paint. He said, you're going to learn when you paint them closets. I said, I'm going to mess up. He said, well, if you mess up, get a rag, wipe out, wipe all that paint off of the, off of the little brim on the door, and you get back to work. And that's the same thing with God. He gives the grace we need. If we mess up, we got the rag of the Holy Ghost. He cleans us up. Glory to God. We got the, the we got Rahab Scarlet. Amen. That we place upon our windows. And the Israelites army will overlook us. The Lord will pass over us. And that's the same thing with God. He provides grace in this battlefield. And thank God for that. Thank God. I love that old hymn that says he provides grace for every day. Every single day, grace, grace. Oh, what a wonderful grace. The grace that brought me down to man. Hallelujah. The grace that brought me down and made me realize who I was. You see, grace never condones your sin. It should bring you to the real mission of sin. And that's what John the Baptist said. i got to continue. The reason why the Lord departed from him was the fact that he had little concern of God's will and work in his kingdom. Now that doesn't necessarily mean he didn't love it, but that meant he struggled with it. A lot of people think that Saul was just a man of the flesh, which he was. But to perform that which was good, he didn't know how to do it. He tried and he tried. You know, the second thing that really burn down the bridge between him and Saul, I mean Saul and Samuel, excuse me, was the fact that God told Samuel to get Saul, and Saul was going to kill all the Elamites. Now, they were of the flesh. That's what they represented. We all know the good old battle of, of Joshua and Elamites. They were Israel's enemies since the very beginning. Right after they left outside of Egypt. And you know what happened? 
a war started. And it wasn't a war of Egypt and Israel. It was an inside war. It was a war of the flesh and the spirit. Now I want to tell you today, we're not just fighting against the powers of darkness. We're not just fighting against the world. We're not just preaching that, that the world is sinners and you need to come to Christ, which is the right message. But we're also fighting against the very self of our own hearts. Every single day I had to realize this. I'm fighting myself. And now I'm not fighting again. I'm not really trying to uh, 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 fast the flesh or, 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 or resign to prayer to fight the flesh or resign to the word of God. Those are just benefits, but those are not the power. That, that is not what feeds the spirit. What feeds the spirit is the faith in Christ and what he provides. Hallelujah. I love what Matthew Henry said. He said the breadcrumbs were just crumbs. The healings were just crumbs. The healings of Christ. Him walking on the water. Him casting out the infirmities were just the crumbs. But when he died on that day on Go Gotham's Hill, let me tell you, that was the bread. That's when you and I began to feast on heavenly manna. Glory to God. And it wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the Gentiles as well. For they said even the dogs deserve crumbs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But he just didn't give us crumbs. He didn't provide us crumbs. He provided us the bread of life. Christ Jesus. The broken body of Christ. Hallelujah. Saul was trying to fight warfare by his own hands. As we try to fight spiritual warfare in our own hands. And when I talk about spiritual warfare, I'm not just talking about the adversary that is obvious, the devil. I want to get that through your guys' heads. I'm not just talking about that when we're, when me and my dad preach about the good fight of faith. We're not just talking about us going against the powers of darkness. No, we're talking about us going against the world and the flesh. So many Christians try to say the battle is against Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. No, we're in the in-between right now. We're in the battlefield right now. And there is no time we can't afford another soul to go and to get walk and walk into hell's gates. We can't afford that. We can't afford one more Christian bound by pornography. We can't afford another Christian bound by alcohol. We can't afford another Christian bound to adultery. We can't, church. The church is in the worst place right now. We are reigning under Saul. But I thank God there's a little David coming to Saul. That there's people telling, telling others that, hey, there's a boy who knows how to play a harp. There's a ministry right here in San Diego, California. Yes, we may be young. Yes, we may not know it all. But we got the anointing of God in this place. Amen. Glory. There's people talking about it. It said that there was people telling Saul, there's a boy in Bethlehem. Hallelujah. There's a ministry on the backside of San Diego. Hallelujah. There's a ministry. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That they know how to operate the presence of God. They know how God works. They know what to preach. They know what feeds the soul. There's somebody but notice that Samuel was out of the picture. Why wasn't Saul going to Samuel, some would ask? Why, was he, why wasn't he going to Samuel? Why wasn't Samuel going to him? Like I said, there was enmity between the flesh and the spirit. Until finally the Lord had to step in. Go to verse 14 if you can, Jacob, if you guys can with me. Hallelujah. He has a moment that I get there. Hallelujah. It says, But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. The spirit of the Lord did not 
depart from Saul, but did so because Saul no longer wanted God, because the Holy Spirit was not wanted, an evil spirit was always allowed to go to Saul and trouble him, but only because of Saul's rebellion. My Lord, listen to what Matthew Henry would say. Listen to what he would say. Give me a moment. But Matthew Henry will state something such a, such that su is such comprehensible for our understanding. It, it really gets to a point where it touches your heart. Listen to what he says. Let me go to it if I can. Give me a moment. so many notes nowadays. It's hard to find. I know. Hallelujah. All right. Listen, it says, Samuel had retired to his own house in Rama with a resolution not only to appear anymore in public business, but to addict himself wholly to instructing and training up the sons of the prophets. And I believe he was raising up the prophet Nathan. It says, and this was the last time that we would hear from Saul in this chapter, I mean Samuel in this chapter. It says he presided as we find he promised himself more satisfaction in young prophets than in young princes. He gave up on the kings. But an anointed one, someone that was the least expected, would be risen up. And let me tell you, it said God called him out to any public action related to the state, but only here to anoint David. Let me read on a little bit. Alrighty. It says, it says, here is Saul made in a terror to himself. The spirit of the Lord departed from him. He having forsaken God and his duty, God in a righteous judgment withdrew from him those assistants of the good spirit with which he was directed, animated, and encouraged in his own government and wars. He lost all his good qualities. This was the effect of his rejecting God and an evidence of his being rejected by him. Now God took his mercy from Saul as it is expressed in verse 15. For when the spirit of the Lord departs from us, all good goes. When men grieve and quench the spirit by willful sin, he departs and will not always strive. The conscience of this was that the, an evil spirit from God troubled him. Those that drive the good spirit away from the dew of course become prey to the evil spirit. Listen, it says, it says, if God and his grace do not rule us, sin and Satan will have possession of us. It says the devil, by the divine humors of his body and passions of his, oh, excuse me, I messed up. It says the divine, the devil, by the divine permission, troubled and terrified Saul by means of the corrupt humors of his body and passions of his mind. So he forfeited the evil concupiscence that Paul said relies in us. He handed him over to the devil. Instead of the fruit of the spirit, he got the what? The works of the flesh. Adultery and uh, infirmity. It goes on. Fornication. Heresy. Heresy. You know, heresy, it, it doesn't necessarily mean of, of just switching over to doctrine, but it means perverting the true. Mm. Doesn't that sound a lot like the modern church? They forfeited their rights. And let me tell you, I want to get into music a little bit. They forfeited the anointing in music in the church. They gave it over to devils. They allowed the world to come in. They thought the world, it worked. They thought if they could, and let me tell you something, Saul's problem wasn't the fact that he decided to go outside of God's will, but it was more to that. When he allowed, you know, because God told Saul to kill off the Alamites. Alamites, excuse me. He told him, specifically, kill all of them. Kill the sons, kill the daughters, kill the babies, kill the aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. But you know who he forgot to kill? He forgot to kill.
killed the king and his livestock. And that is what self. Alemic always represented the flesh. And you can try to kill off the actions of the flesh, but if you do not kill the problem, my friend, if you do not destroy the problem, well, what is the problem? The problem isn't the action of sin. The problem is the sin that relies in our hearts, the original sin. We don't sin because of our actions. We sin because our hearts are exceedingly wicked. Isaiah said, my heart is undone, and wickedness my lips cry. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. He knew that he was the problem, not the fact of his evil doings or the matter of concupiscence writing about him, but he knew that he committed spiritual adultery. And spiritual adultery, someone would ask, well, what is that? And I don't have time to get into spiritual adultery, but it's recorded in Romans chapter 7, 1 through 4. It's that we are married to Christ, but when we try to serve the law, when we try to serve it by our own doings, we will create ourselves another Jesus. Paul said, and I believe it is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, that we have served another Jesus. We served another master. And said, you know, in the old Torahs, they would have, in order for a bondwoman or a bondman to be a slave, they would, they would put a little hole in their ear. And that represented that they were their slave and they would have their little earring or design or whatever poked in their ear, a hole in there. And that meant that they were that they were someone's slave. That they were they had a Pacific owner. They weren't just on the auction block anymore. And that's the same thing with Christ. We are bond to Christ now. And if we try to serve the law outside of Christ and who he is and what he performed, we are marrying another master we are marrying the flesh and the flesh has no merit it has no name it afforded us Paul said the first Adam failed and through his falling through the fall of Adam came in sin and through one man brought it all death in Romans chapter 5 but he said through one advent through the second Adam hallelujah through Christ brought in one death and brought life and to all the sons of men. Hallelujah. But like I stated, the concupiscence would arise, the flesh will rise when we go after it. Paul, I mean Saul, excuse me, Saul of Judah, not Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Judah, he would want, he would reside the, the, the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the will of God in his life, the fruit of the Spirit, and rely, put it aside, if I can say he would cheat, if I can say, on the very anointing and, and the presence and the manifestation of the work of God in his life, and he would write about all the manner of concupiscence. Now, it wasn't the fact that Saul didn't he didn't know what was happening. I, I believe he did. I believe he was risen by one of the greatest prophets that, that Israel has ever known, Samuel. Yes, he had his faults, but Samuel knew how the anointing worked. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But Saul was pleasing to man's eye. You know, it said that wherever Saul went, he, he, it said that he, when he turned his shoulder, there was a victory. Hallelujah. He was a victorious warrior. But when the time came to fight the Philistine giant, he wasn't able to perform that which God intended. And that's the same thing with you and I. We're born again. There's victory all around. But when we try to fight the fight, that is not our fight. You see, because the fight was meant for the anointed one. Amen? The fight was meant for David, our heavenly David. Amen. It wasn't meant for Saul. The fight against sin wasn't meant for you and I. It was not. But it was meant for Christ. Let me read on. It says, it says, he grew fretful and peevish and discontented and suspicious ever starting and trembling. He was sometimes, says Joseph, as if he had been choked or strangled and a Perfect demonic by fits. It says this made him unfit for business in his counsels, the contempt of his enemies, and a burden to all about him. But here is David. He is made a physician 
to Saul. Oh, hallelujah. And no, Saul did not have a mental disorder. I was reading an article on, on this. I just looked it up. You know, I want to hear what other people have to say. I'm not close-minded, but yet again, I am close-minded. Hallelujah. I love to hear what other people say, but when I know it's wrong, I'm going to say it's wrong. Amen. And if they don't have a right to speak, I don't have a right to speak. So I began reading it. And he said there was either three things. That he was either possessed by a demon, or he had a mental disorder. And thirdly, that he was depressed. And I, and I was thinking, reading this article, how can he even, he was a minister, how can a minister can even, how could he even compete the two? A mental disorder. And I'm going to tell you, educated people, that there is no such thing as a mental disorder. There is no such thing as someone being depressed. No, they are being either possessed or oppressed by demonic spirits. And I better start hearing preachers preach on it. I better start hearing preachers preaching on the very powers of darkness that try to beset us. And say they're trying to water it down, but preaching on demon spirits will scare our people. It better scare them. But it also better tell them that our God is more than able. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors in Christ, through Christ Jesus. And they said David was like a type of psychologist talking to them about his problems. Yeah. My Lord. He wasn't a psychologist. He was a great physician. He was better than someone with a PhD. That's right. Why? Because he knew the answer. And it's the Spirit of God. Now what? It says the Spirit of God that is able to cast out all fear and give a sound of mind. Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. Like Matthew Henry said, when, when, the, when you leave the presence of God, when you go out of God's will, whatever it may be, it may be physically, You've gone to a wrong place, or spiritually. I know it may be some of you guys, you allow other doctrines to be heard and to take root in your heart that you know is wrong. You've allowed the enemy to come in. Worldly music. Worldly music. You know, I had a problem with this, I'm not going to lie. And it wasn't with rap music. It wasn't with music that we could obviously point out that's bad. But it was Christian music that was not anointed by God. Well, I thought it's for God. Let me tell you something. It can't just be for God. It has to be birthed out by God. It has to be conceived and birthed out and then consecrated by God. And that's what makes a difference, my friend. The reason why SBN has such an anointing is it's because it's conceived. It's birthed out. It's consecrated by the work of, by the work of Almighty God. Not because of necessarily the people, but because of their hearts for the anointing that they can't perform that which they need to perform without the Spirit of God. No, they're not perfect. Neither am I. If we were all perfect, we would not be here right now because this is a church. It should really be called the Church of the Unredeemed, transforming to the redeemed. Come on, somebody. It should be the Church of the Unredeemed, be conformed to the redeemed. We're the opposite. But we heed to the Spirit. We hearken to it. We're being transformed by the Spirit of God. Now I have to close, and I want to close with this. It says, Here is David to Saul, and by this means brought to court a physician that helped him against the worst of diseases when none else could. David was newly appointed privately to the kingdom. It says it would be of use to him to go to the court and see the world and hear his doing is so brought about for him without any, 
without any of his friends being a part of it. No, those whom God designs for a service, his providence shall concur with his grace and to prepare and qualify for it. Saul is distempered. His servants have honestly encouraged him to tell him what his distemper is. An evil spirit, not by chance, but from God and his providence, trouble thee. Now, this states one thing he notes. It says, this means that they all advised him to believe for it, to, for his relief was music. He said, let us have a cunning player on the harp to attend thee. How much better friends had they had been to him if they had advised him, since the evil spirit was from the Lord, to give all diligence to make his peace with God by true repentance. Hmm. That's the only problem, was it, that was wrong with it. You know, Saul, when he, when he messed up with the Philistines, you know what he did for Samuel? When he messed up, when he blew things off, as all of us do, I don't know, I'm close with this. I preached enough when my battery goes out. That means it's time to go. You know, one time I preached and I, my nose was bleeding. <laughs> I was thinking, Lord, have you given me the spirit of Jesus? Because he sweated out blood when yes, he was praying. Did. I was just thinking that. <laughs> but anyway, however, Saul was in a distemperment. And the only problem was with, they said, the total music, which was indeed a right thing, but they should have brought him to the sacrifice. Because when, when he, he, knew, he knew, when he failed to go to the sacrifice, what did he do when he failed against the Philistines? He, it said that he brought him to sacrifices unto Saul. Hallelujah. And that's our answer to our failure, my friend. You see, what they should have done before they got David was pray the blood of Jesus over them. But they said how, how great of friends it was so that they thought, hey, let's go to someone who knows how to usher the presence of God. And it was by word of mouth that they knew David. David didn't have no advertisement. He wasn't going around Israel touring. Right. <laughs> but by the fact of that people were hearing and seeing yeah. in that field, as the heavens... They say that the people before, like the, the very beginning, even of Genesis, you could hear the God the Father being delighted in Christ's worship. You know, it said that when Christ died, it said that, that all of heaven stood still. Why? Because it was a sweet savor that went up to God. It was the greatest worship, greatest music. His cry, and he said, Lord, why have you forsaken him was the most pleasing lyrics, if I can say. The greatest songs someone could ever sing. Why? Because God delighted in his agony. Hallelujah. Someone would say, well, why would God do such a thing? Why would God delight in such a thing? In a sacrifice. Because there, liberty was brought to man. Yes. Amen. If we can all please stand. I'm going to finish this next week. I'm going to part two. Some music musicians made with that. And I want to close with this. If you need a sacrifice, and we all do, we should all be 